Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Jay Goltz, Liz Piccarazzi, and William Vanderblumen talk about sales, specifically the transition most founders have to make from handling sales themselves to building a sales team. Jay, Liz, and William also discuss the value of going to trade shows, the pros and cons of compensating salespeople based on commission, and the differences between inside sales and outside sales. The kind of person, Jay says, that can go out there and cold call all day long and get the door slammed in their face, it's very hard to find, very hard to keep, very hard to train, very hard to control. And that's been my biggest challenge in business without any doubt. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, which highlights the most important news of the day for business owners and which you can subscribe to at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining me this week on the podcast are Jay Goltz, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home. Liz Piccarazzi, who is CEO of City Bin, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, and makes trash enclosures and package bins. And William Vanderblumen, who is CEO of Vanderblumen Search Group, a Houston-based recruiting firm that works with churches and other faith-based organizations. The episode is titled, The Hardest Thing I've Done in Business. Welcome, Jay, Liz, and William. It's great to have you all here. Liz, last week you told us something I found intriguing that I'd like to follow up on. You mentioned that after the pandemic hit, you brought your husband into the business as COO and that he's taken over many of the responsibilities at Citibin that you didn't think you were good at. One of those areas you said was sales. Um, and I'd like to talk some more about that. Can you tell us how were you handling sales before Frank joined the business? First, to make a little correction, I actually am very good at sales. Ah. But when my business is small, and with both of my businesses, when they were small, I was very involved with sales. So as the business scales and I you know, delegate to other people and we have more and more customers, most importantly, it tends to get um, a little disorderly, you know, despite having CRM and other sorts of HubSpot tools. But what I've found is that if I set up a sales process and it's being followed really well, I don't need to be that involved with sales. I do not manage sales very well. So that's what I was referring to last week is that I've never been a sales director, or sales manager that has 10 people working for me pounding the pavement. Like I've never had that. And I know it's something I'm need, I'm going to need to get to. Um, so until we get to that point, Frank, my husband, he is the sales manager and he manages a team of three and he's doing a really good job at it, but he also has never managed a sales team. So we know we, we could get some extra help with this. We definitely want to scale, you know, we've got a great product when I'm out there selling, I do a great job, but we just need, we need to scale our sales operation. You've mixed up three things in one, so I just want to clarify. You just mixed up inside salespeople and you said people pounding the pavement. Two completely different things. So managing an inside sales force is nothing like managing an outside sales force, from my experience. And number two is... Wait, 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 make sure we understand. What, what distinction are you drawing, drawing between inside and outside? Is inside people who work in a retail store... No, person sitting answers the phone, hello, and they go, hi, I'm looking, and they can explain the products and services versus someone going out there looking for business. Completely different. Well, it's like inbound, outbound. So our inbound is very strong with our SEO game, with our email newsletters, with our inbound, even on phone. But the outbound, you know, people going out there to hunt, to go into new markets we've never been in, hiring ex external salespeople. I've dabbled with that a little bit, but it really is, to your point, Jay, it's about the the external sales team. Um, internal, we're doing pretty well. So, Liz, what percentage of your sales would you guess are inbound versus outbound? Probably 90-10, 90 inbound. Yeah, same here. Is it more of a transactional sales process or a consultative sales process? Does that make sense? Yeah, it is. It's definitely consultative. 
Yeah. So when you figure out how to do outbound sales in a consultative process, please send me the notes because we cannot figure that out. And so we, we just keep pouring more and more effort into marketing toward the top of our funnel, increasing our SQLs and focus on inbound sales almost exclusively. So wait, explain that to me. Does that mean it seems to me, William, and you're that you've got fish in a barrel. There's so many churches in the United States. You can clearly get the list. Are you sending out actual mailings to them? Nope, nope. Um, our I first of all, I don't think it works. I think the history of direct mail, which by the way is history, uh, except for a few of our clients, which still insist on doing it, they market to a little bit older database. History of direct mail is like a 1% return. And I would say the same is true for outbound calls. And so I could hire a a mutual friend of ours that I'll leave nameless, suggest that I hire a few young guns, just make outbound calls, make 100 calls a day, maybe you'll land one. Um, It's not just that it's cost ineffective, it dilutes the brand. And this is just my opinion. And, and to remind listeners, I have a religion degree with a philosophy minor. And I've said this before, but most people that have those degrees spend their entire career saying, do you want fries with that? So I am learning as I go. Wait, come on, William. How long have you been running this business? In my opinion, if, if we're just calling saying, let me tell you how we can solve your problem today. Hey, we're here when you move. I know how to, I know how to sell like that. I think uh, the brand we're trying to drive is thought leader, trusted advisor. It'd be kind of like what Goldman Sachs used to be in its absolute heyday. They didn't do cold outbound calls. You came to them because you knew they were the best. So, so we're focusing our efforts on content that drives people toward us as experts, trusted advisors. For instance, I mean, the vast majority of pastors in the country are nearing retirement age. We could be doing cold calls about succession. Instead, we poured our eggs into the basket of, let's write a book on succession, which is now in every library at every seminary in the country, and is the textbook on the matter, and and people come to us. And I won't say outbound sales is a bad idea. I just think for us, what I've found is uh, we're a brand new idea with zero trust factor, and highly consultative in sales. And that has led me to believe that the best thing I can do is put free content out that builds trust. And then when they call, have incredibly good inside salespeople that are consultative in their approach. Okay. Again, you've mushed three things together that are completely different. You said, well, direct mail only gets 1%. That's a good return. If you bought a 10,000 person list, 1% of 10,000 is a hundred people. And for what it costs to do a, a stupid mailing with a beautiful letter addressed to the right people, if you had a hundred live leads from that would be a, a home run. So 1% is, is a great return. Number one. Number two is you've mixed together outbound calls with mailing, two completely separate things. I would think that a beautifully written letter to the head person at a church saying a lot, of, here's what we do, would get some attention. And I and people always go, oh, I throw all my direct mail out. Do you think these people do that thing because they lose money? I get direct mail every day. It's obviously working for some companies. They would stop doing it. So I, I, I don't think direct mail is dead by any stretch of the imagination. And I think you could send out a very sophisticated letter to the churches. And until you try that and tell me it doesn't work, I think your opinion is a guess versus I tried that and it didn't work. Well, you know what, Jay? You've actually given me a lot to think about, and you've been at this longer than I have. So I, I, I'm going to take that to heart and go back and drop back to my team, particularly uh, maybe a direct mail towards succession clients, which tend to be older, which actually read mail. Uh, maybe you're right. Uh, what I don't want to do, and, and, I, and like you say, it's just a guess. What I don't want to do is get 100 leads and then have 9,900 potential clients think that's an ambulance chaser. He's just trying to do a slick sale. I don't want to be around him. I think you're overly sensitive. I think a sophisticated mailing with a beautiful letter looking like it was just written to them is not a bad brand thing. Well, you, you have just made my hour, Jay. I'm dead serious. You've given me something to think about. Listen, I've tried a lot. You know, I, I, I had a big idea one year that, you know, I sell to people to buy art and there was the Gold Coast Art Fair. So I had this idea. I'm going to hire one of those airplanes with a banner, Artist Frame Service, so flying over the 50,000 people that are buying art at the art fair. And, and it was thinking out of the box. And I did that. Now, did it work? No, it was complete failure because it took me about three seconds when I got downtown. I realized 
you can't look up at a, a banner when you're downtown Chicago. That's for the people looking out <laughs> over the horizon. The point of my story is it was a complete failure, but that was one failure. I've got three other success stories that I kept doing. So, you know, you got to try some stuff. It, 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 that one aggravated me just because they clearly knew at the airplane company this wasn't going to work. So, Let's go back to, to where we started with Liz. I think what she described is kind of a classic entrepreneurial dilemma. Um, it, at most companies, the person who starts the business is the one who, is the person who sells it best. But you can only grow so much doing all the sales yourself. At a certain point, you have to grow beyond that. Liz, I'm curious. You, you said you weren't good at managing a sales team. How do you know what, what didn't work when you were managing a sales team? One, I don't really enjoy it that much. I don't know exactly what that means, but having like a scorecard and tracking the sales and finding out where it is in the funnel, um, it's just not my, my forte. You know, I'm definitely more of the creative person, the visionary. And But you said you're good at sales. Arguably, you might be the best person at the company to teach someone else how to do what you were able to do. Yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it. And the people that are in the company, I have taught them on the existing segments that we're working with. And so we primarily work with property managers, developers, you know, affluent residential homeowners. And so they only need to deal with those customers. But I have a couple of segments that we're starting to get business from without trying that I want more of. So Harvard University for just a couple of their dormitories needed trash enclosures and they came to us. So we've got a great installation up there. We've got a great case study. But if I say to the team, how do we get 10 more Harvards? We don't quite know where to go with it. You know, we're not getting traction with some of the things that we're trying. So that's where the idea of if I had an external sales force and I had someone who was a manufacturer's rep for a brand that sold to facilities managers at colleges like Harvard, could someone pull out their Rolodex and be able to get us into a hundred other universities? I feel like something like that should exist, but I haven't been able to get to it. First of all, when you describe management of your sales force as keeping track of, that's not really management. I would argue, I question whether you hired the right people in the first place, number one, don't know. And number two, did you train them properly? Because if you hire the right people and you train them properly, you're not selling brain surgery. There's no reason they shouldn't be able to have an intelligent conversation with a customer that calls in. So I think that could work. But again, I'm going back to why not do a mailing to the facility managers of every university or there's magazines that are targeted just to those people. That's all they do. And I, there's other ways of management than the most expensive one that I found is hiring an outside salesperson and managing them. That salary would pay 10, 10 mailings that I think you could get some great leads from. And I've done it. Right. Or ads, ads and trade shows too. So I know in that segment, absolutely, there are definitely trade shows that we're going to start going to and their trade publications. I've gone to some. I've, I've I've gone to some of those trade shows because we sell to, we sell artwork. So we've we tried going to some of those those comp, those trade shows that are specifically for facility managers, and they're looking for stuff like you're selling. So I I wouldn't be so quick to be hiring an outside salesperson because that's been the most difficult thing I've ever done in business: trying to hire, train, manage, and get results from people who want to make. Mm, eighty thousand dollars a year. The sale, the salesperson you're going to hire for thirty is not going to do it. In my experience, it's just they can make a hell of a lot more money doing something else. Jay, what was your transition like going from being the entrepreneur who does all the selling to hiring a staff and managing people who do it for you? Well, first of all. To be specific, I'm in a retail business, so I had to just find people who could take care of customers. They didn't have to go out and find customers. That's a huge difference, night and day. So I started hiring people with art backgrounds and, you know, started learning how to train them. And I have to say that. That was fairly simple compared to the next 20 years I spent trying to find outside salespeople to sell artwork, which um, it took me too many years to figure out. Inside salespeople are completely different than outside salespeople. I always use the example of it's the difference between cats and dogs. They both are similar, but cats go out and will kill things on their own and figure out how to bring it back in. But they're not always your best friend like a dog is. They're completely different species. And 
and, and what I was doing was I was hiring nice people because that's what I did in my retail business. And I found out that just because someone's nice doesn't mean they know how to go out and find business. So um, I hired lots of nice people that couldn't sell, that couldn't bring in business. And like I said, night and day, inside salespeople are not outside salespeople. I, I, before I would go hire a salesperson and train them and, set, and wind them up and send them out in the market, I'd be doing some mailings. I'd be doing some trade shows. I'd be doing some outbound, uh, well, in your case, people are looking for your product, perhaps, I would be spending time on making sure my website looks good, which your website looks very good. So I would think that that would be a great platform to, to get customers to. I do have a question about your website, though. I see that you're offering 10% off for signing up. And my question is, it looks like you're selling a first class grade product. Why do you feel compelled to give them 10% off? Because by giving me their email address, I can market to them, and that's worth a lot to me. And you believe you have to give 10% off to get their email address? It's been very effective, yes. You know, because then if they give me the email address, then they go into my drip marketing campaign and they're going to get, you know, 10 emails from me over the next couple of months. Um, and we can track who comes in and buys from that. How long is the 10% off good for? Is that forever or is it just buy in the next 30 days? I mean, what's it's actually forever is for as long as they're on our email newsletter. So anyone that gets our email newsletter can use that 10% off. So theoretically, you could argue you built it into your price that pretty much everyone that's buying is getting 10 off, I would assume. Okay. That might make sense. Yes. I think you got a great looking website and a product that I I'm amazed in Chicago. People are they're just leaving boxes on the sidewalk. It's unbelievable. They're, they're just leaving entire boxes on the sidewalk. And I'm thinking, how long is that going to last? And it seems to me... You're, you're talking about delivery deliveries, boxes. Deliveries. I would think that I'd be contacting UPS. They have to be losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in claims for products that were stolen. I would think that they would want to help you sell your product. I would, but they actually have a competitive solution, and that's that they have lockers at a lot of major retailers, uh, um, including, I think, Lowe's, um, some gas stations, 7-Elevens. Um, same thing with FedEx has those, and as we know, Amazon lockers are everywhere, including in all Whole Foods. So those lockers are not convenient. I mean, my product solves the problem of convenience because you're still having your package delivered to your home. If you have to go to Whole Foods and get your package from an Amazon locker, that kind of takes away the convenience, but you get the safety. So I would love for them to subsidize my business, but they have their own solution. Are you getting a good amount of business from people that just saw the bins out on someone's in front of their house and they call in? Yes. So that is probably our best marketing is the product itself. Um, people, you know, in New York City in particular, you have your, you have your lockers, your package locker, your trash enclosures right in front of your house. It's not like in Chicago where you have um, alleys and driveways. Um, so I, I would, I would have loved to have gone into the Chicago market, but we haven't done as much there because people don't need to keep their trash in front of their homes. They can put it in their alley in the back. Here's my thought with that, though. You've got City Bin in a fairly small logo on the side of the product, and I would think you'd want to put it in the front of the product with dot .com on it so people can clearly see, oh, I can go right to there and find out where these things came from. And you've got a great name, and you got, you happen, you got the URL. So I would think your greatest underused asset is simply the thousands of boxes sitting out on the sidewalk that people would just see. You know, when you buy a Craftsman tool chest, they've got a gigantic logo plate on it. And your, your logo is very small on there. I would think that would be your best form of advertising. Well, it's funny that you said that because the logo that we use now is considerably larger than the last logo plate we used. And I'm pretty happy with the size, but I definitely will take that into consideration, Jay. I mean, don't you think putting .com on it would help? Yeah, definitely. Possibly if they think they can go right online and buy it. Definitely. That's the whole point. They don't have to think about it. And they're walking with their phone in their hand. They could literally they could literally dial right in when they're walking by someone's house while it's on their mind and, and put it right in and boom. Now they call into your 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 office and you have your well trained salesperson close the deal. Boom. Exactly. William, I want to go back to you. What was uh, your transition like from being the person driving all the sales to what was the next step? Uh, it was a lesson in humility. A uh, um, couple, couple things. I had assumed 
that uh, like Jay, you know, let's find somebody you're doing framing. Let's find somebody that knows art. Then they can talk the language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I figured if I'm selling at the time, it was primarily to churches. Now we're helping schools find headmasters and nonprofits find CEOs and values-based businesses find their CEO, even on a for-profit side. But back then it was just churches. And I thought I needed somebody who had worked in a church, who knew the language, who knew all the things. I went to a couple of interesting learning sessions that were sort of closed audience. Uh, one particularly was led by the head, uh, the lead team of the sales department for Salesforce. So pretty interesting. So they talked about founder CEOs as either operationally driven or growth driven, right? So you get somebody who loves running the business or growing the business. And that was their hypothesis. And so obviously I slot into the growth. I'm paying attention to this and I did all the sales. I love selling things. And so uh, they said the number one lid to companies at the time, it was like, how do we get from 1 million to 10 million? The lid for that threshold is the founder CEO who really believes no one else can handle the sales like they can. And I'm like, ugh, guilty as charged. And then they said that the number one lid to a founder finding an EVP of sales that's effective is the founder believing that the person has to come out of the industry they're in. And they used the example of a, a tractor company that felt like they had to find farmers from the Midwest that understood seed and all these things. The bottom line of the, the workshop was, here's the deal. Salespeople can sell anything. You just have to teach them what they're selling. So you get good at teaching them the product, they'll get good at selling. And that's exactly what happened with us. Uh, the second lesson in humility was that I am arguably the worst trainer manager of salespeople in the history of sales. Uh, I brought on a wonderful team member, Sarah, who's been with me a long, long time, and she was selling uh, homes. She was the person when you drive into a subdivision and go to the model home, she's the one sitting there and selling people their first home. So high anxiety, transaction, high level widget, a uh, lot, lot of the same things that our clients are experiencing on a sales call. Zero industry experience. So we tried teaching her the business and she learned it very well. And, and then I said, okay, let me train you sales. And I, I even got a coach to teach me and I was just terrible at it. Finally, I said, Sarah, now we're, we're going to use the book of Ruth as our training manual. Uh, there's a line that says, whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou stayest, I will stay. In other words, Sarah, I don't know how to teach you. So your desk is now next to mine for the next four months and you figure me out and figure out how. To... And she did. And she needed no industry experience. Experience. She was able to figure out the sales without me doing training. She's now turned into a fabulous trainer of salespeople and uh, has, has, for lack of a better idiom, given birth to an entire team. But for me, uh, Lauren, it was a lesson. One, don't be so arrogant, William. Don't think people have to be in your industry to sell to your industry. Two, don't think you know how to train just because you know how to sell. In entirely different prospects and, and entirely different profiles of candidates to hire. Uh, I, I think I probably sympathize and empathize with Liz. I don't like dealing with a sales team. It's, there are too many people involved. I just want to sell if I'm going to sell. So a lesson in humility in, in my inability to train, even though I know how to sell, and my arrogance at thinking people had to know my industry in order to sell to my industry. Wait, you're leaving out the most important part. How did you find her? Where does she come from? Referral of a friend. Uh, in fact, she wanted to. She wanted to get out of. Uh, she was working in this home sales thing, and she's always been very values driven. Like she loves her church. We were looking for some people on our research team. Uh, frankly, we'd already filled the job, and we, we were really small at the time. This was eight years ago, and uh, we'd already hired everybody. But I met her for a drink with, along with my COO, and the three of us sat together for a while. And when she left, we were like, okay, we got to figure out where to put her. So we created a role on the research team with the hope that maybe one day she could learn the whole industry and then become a salesperson. So she sold you, basically, because she has what I she call did. it. No, she, she has me. it. Absolutely. No, she has it, and which gets back to what I always say. It's about hiring. It's about hiring. It's about hiring. It's about hiring. And most entrepreneurs I talk to, almost all, they're managing the wrong people. And whenever I ask them, wait, can you explain to me where you found them? They go, oh, it was my neighbor's brother-in-law's sister. And like, they really weren't qualified. They just put them in the spot because they showed up. In your case, you got a recommendation. You talked to her. You liked her. You hired her. That wasn't luck. And she's successful. 
that's what my whole company's filled with, my salespeople. I found that there's people that are better than I am at it because they're just schmoozier than I am. And I finally got to where I got better at hiring those people. And I have to tell you, no one ever asked for me. And when I say no one, I mean, I can't think of the last time where someone called me down to the show, oh, uh, so-and-so here, they want to see you. The average frame shop, it's all about the owner. They've got to see the owner. Mm. And I, you can't grow a company like that. Have any of you tried uh, compensating salespeople on straight salary and not on commission? I have. Has it worked? Yes. What I didn't want was cowboy culture of that's my lead, not yours. I wanted a pull for the team mentality. And so we've played with a lot of different things. And Sarah really put me at ease saying, William, I've been selling stuff for seven years now. And I think I've had seven different models for compensation. So just treat me fairly. Give me a number. I will perform better if there's a number on my head than not. So we set a salary plus a bonus if you hit numbers. Um, so, so it's not really a commission. Uh, it was company-wide numbers, not her personal numbers. Of course, the sales team was Sarah and me. So, you know, uh, now uh, we're a little more commission-based, but it's very low commission. And there are two commissions, one for your individual sales and one for sales of the team. And then Sarah, who leads the team, is only on sales of the team. So we're trying to make her replicate herself and be just as incentivized to have an amazing team that doesn't have her doing sales calls. But just to be clear, it's inside sales. The leads are coming into her, correct? Yes. Or is she going out? Is she actually going out and looking for business or are the leads coming in and she's dealing with the leads? Very, very rare that she uh, goes out looking very rare. Okay. So my point is that is an inside salesperson. And if you hired her and said here and wound her up and said, you go out there and find business, she probably couldn't do it because like I said, cats and dogs, completely different animals. Uh, the per kind of person that can go out there and cold call all day long, and get the sl door slammed in, in their face. It's very hard to find, very hard to keep, very hard to train, very hard to control. And um, my, that's been my biggest challenge in business without any doubt that I'm a retailer. I'm used to hiring nice people to take care of customers and hiring an outside sales force is just 180 degrees away from running an inside sales force. I look at what the corporate world, which is been doing search longer than the nonprofit world has done. And you've got a uh, spectrum where one is just cowboy culture and consultants are rewarded based on the sales they produce and the bills they collect. It's almost like they're a solopreneur using the house brand. And then the other end of the spectrum is we're all going to get paid based on how the company does and your tenure is what weights your bonus. And that feels more like Europe than the United States. So I'm trying to find a middle ground and I don't know that I've got it figured out. I'm wide open to listeners sending me something to, to find a way to split Solomon's baby or, or you guys on the, on the call. Um, it's, it's a wild tightrope to try and ride. I think the fact is you're still a business that's going to be mostly an in if you generate leads by doing good marketing you're inside salespeople, and i think it's just a much easier business model than hiring someone to go out there looking for business uh and i i don't think it's broken at the moment from what it sounds like it sounds like you got it figured out i don't know, i don't know that you do have a dilemma it sounds like you got it figured out and if you did a little more marketing meaning mailings whatever all of a sudden you have more leads coming in life is grand well, my next meeting is with my marketing guy just because I've already texted him during this podcast saying, okay, Jay says we have to meet. Do the math. You send out 10,000 envelopes and you get not 1%, you get 0.2%. That's 20 people that responded that say, oh, that's interesting. Call me. Like, I got to think how many of those would you have to close to pay for a 10,000 piece mailing? Two? One? Liz, how about you? Have you had the issue of the salary versus commission? We have, and we do a hybrid right now that I think is working fairly well. Um, so we have a really fantastic employee that came in as an assembly. He did assembly, um, and then he moved into the shop, and then he started doing sales, and then he started doing scheduling. So he's very strong in, in internal sales, um, and he's also good at doing all the scheduling. So he gets a salary for all the operational things that he does in the business, which are pretty significant. And then he also gets commission based on the sales. 
But in listening to you, one thing I realized is that he's really good at those two things together in a way that he never could be if I had him trying to pound the pavement, which I've been kind of encouraging and it hasn't been going very far. So it's like looking at what is he like as a person, how does he work best? I think that where he's at right now is really good and that there's some danger in having me inc- try to get him to get like 20 more universities. So that's the sort of thing I would encourage him as a non-external salesperson to try to do. And that's where I'm not getting the traction. And it's not like it's his fault, but I have this idea that he can do inside or outside. That's what I've, it's like telling your dog, run out there to the tree, run up the tree and get that bird for me. It ain't going to work. And it's not their fault. They're dogs. I mean, meaning they're friendly, they're happy, but you got to feed a dog. Outside salespeople go out and, and, and they're like the cat. They go climb fences, they kill birds, they come back with something in their mouth. It's a different animal. And I've been doing this for 20 years and I have never succeeded taking an inside salesperson and converting them to an outside salesperson. I, I, maybe it's just me, but I don't think so. Have any of you ever hired a sales consultant or thought about hiring a sales consultant? What do you mean? Somebody who comes in and looks at your, uh, you know, whose whose job it is to look at a company's sales operation and uh, make suggestions about how better to manage it. Yeah. So, so at the risk of getting kicked off the podcast and never invited back, I'll be transparent. I am a Tony Robbins guy. Sorry, cut me off right now. Sorry, Lauren. I had gone to one of his mastermind smaller gatherings and uh, hired one of his top level coaches that was particular to sales uh, who had, who had specialized in inside sales and I signed him to a six month contract. We met once a week. Um, it was super helpful to me. He gave me homework to do. We had a very directed call um, and he was, he was part of the process of moving Sarah into her role. I don't know that we would have gotten there as quickly without him. That makes sense. I think he's a smart guy. He's uber successful. I'm sure there's something to what he's doing. Lauren hadn't spoken yet, Jason. Now maybe we're both kicked off the podcast. No, 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 no. He has no podcast left then, so I'm not worried about that. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he's going to have to do outside sales. (laughs) Liz, have you thought about hiring a sales consultant? I would definitely consider it. Um, We've done Sandler training, which has been helpful. What's that? Um, so Sandler is a sales training course. I think it's somewhat of a franchise. It is a franchise. They're all over the country. Yeah. And so it's very specific to sales. And um, my main salesperson, I sent that to him a few years ago before you know he had done any sales and it did a lot of work. Um, but that's a different thing than saying as a company, how are you going to set up their, your sales operation and, and how are you going to differentiate how you set it up for inside versus outside and how do you match that up with your marketing? I mean, I think that there could be a lot done with that. But I also have never had anyone say to me, oh, I hired this great sales consultant. You definitely need to call him or her. And if I did hear that, I would call that person. No, I I don't. I think in your business model, I... I don't think you're an outside sales force kind of company. I think you've got this hot, great product that so many people need. I think that doing the right marketing to get leads to your inside killer crew of knowledgeable, good people is the business model. I don't see your business model being one where you hire six sales reps to go out and call on buildings. I I don't think the math's going to work. I'll tell you why I don't think that way. So we're about 60% B to B and 40 40% B2C. And our B2C game with, you know, our email marketing and some of the advertising and the, we do direct mail and we do some ads, you know, that works really well. For the other B2B, we're talking about property managers, architects, facilities managers. They're these bodies, these groups that tend to purchase in a certain way. And um, it's not, I, I feel like I don't have enough connection. So like, for example, we've got a big um, job with AT&T within their retail stores in the Southeast. And I think we're in like 20 or 30 stores with our package delivery locker because they have some very like expensive gear that they need to transfer between stores. So our package lockers are being used as kind of an intermediary. And I'm like, okay, well, that's one type of commercial entity with a retail space. Who has a brain that can go out there and say, I'm going to find 30 more AT&Ts? 
I feel like someone could do that. Someone that has sold into those types of industries, someone that has sold to universities before. But it's not so easy because if I've gone on LinkedIn and I've tried to mine it for <laughs> who has sold trash cans to universities, that's not very easy to find. But if I could find that person that sold supplies to facilities, then I would think they would be really good at doing what I want them to do. There are independent sales reps that call on those kinds of companies and they have six lines and they sell all those different things. So I would be looking for an independent sales rep that's already into those places and says, oh, wow, this is a great addition to my, you know, my selection. I I don't think it's a full-time employee. So it would be like a manufacturer's rep. Yeah. And there's, that's what, you know, I'm dealing with, I've talked before, I I deal with, uh, somebody who's selling into the autism space of we're we're selling exercise and we're selling an app. And we found out that there are companies out there that do nothing but sell into the school systems and to governments and we're finding those companies to sell our app to and to sell our certification to because reinventing the wheel, trying to call all those places would be, would be impossible. And it, and there are reps that do that. So I think if you spent a little time just looking for reps that call, all on institutions, you'll find out there's a bunch of them and they've got, you find one rep group, they've got 20 reps to work for them. They cover the entire country. Liz, I'm curious, you sell package bins and you sell trash enclosures. They're largely targeting the the same customer, I, I assume. Are there any differences in the way you sell them? Yes. The, the need is very different. So when we're talking about trash enclosures, we talk a lot about you know, trash hygiene and managing recycling and keeping rats out and the pain of all those things. The pain of having a package locker or having a package stolen is very different. They do work modularly together. So we often get people that will buy uh, a trash enclosure for trash recycling and then a package locker. So they're getting three modules that all work together. And that's a really cool thing to market because we're selling it as a combination unit. And uh, you know, everything about the space utilization and the design, Like I'm really excited about selling that. It's been selling okay. I wish it would sell a lot more, but the modularity of it has been a big part. So have you ever done a trade show for facility managers? We have done them for um, property managers, which are kind of similar. Yeah. Um, Facilities managers, like in a straight way, we haven't. But I I did get my assistant to pull together a, a list of all the trade shows that were with potential target groups, including exterminators. Um, so if exterminators can sell our um, trash enclosures through to their clients that are dealing with rat problems. You know, we're the only trash enclosure that they can confidently recommend. See, I don't know that they want to, though, because if they solve the problem, they just lost the customer. I don't know if they have any incentive to, t- to sell them a thing. Oh, if you do this, you won't have any more rat problems. There goes their, their customer. I don't know that that would be the most motivated group to be selling through. So my question is, when you did the trade show for property managers, did it work? It did. It's been the best trade show we've ever done, and we've done it for There you go. I think that's your future. Do six trade shows a year and the business will just roll in. Yeah. The ROI on that trade show, a couple that are related to property management has always been there. And every time I've tried to go to a trade show for something that's like architecture, design, or even waste related, landscape architecture related, none of those were worthwhile. And it was disappointing because I personally enjoy those other shows more than property management. But that is really where our main buyers are. Because for them, if you're a property manager and you're dealing with a a building that has a rat rat problem, your phone is ringing all the time with people that are complaining about rats. So you're not going to be very price sensitive about it because you just want the best solution. So your phone will be ringing less with rat complaints. So it simply gets to, you need to go to people that have a problem and those other things, architects, architects don't have the problem. They're not getting the calls from the the tenants. It's so you need to continue going to trade shows that they need to solve their rat problem and exterminators and architects, all, that, not, not their problem. They're not the ones that are on the front line. I think there's a reason why some trade shows are working great and some don't. Have any of you changed your approach to sales because of COVID? Are you doing anything differently today than you were before 2020? I'd say we, uh, and we've discussed this some on the 
other podcasts, Lauren, but I think what we've discovered during the pandemic is what we're calling the very top of the funnel, and that is uh, giving away free assistance during the mess that we're in uh, and not making any money on it, but building a lot of friendships that we think will outlast the pandemic. And so far, that's paid off pretty well. Um, you know, ask me in 10 years, but uh, yeah, so far, that's pretty 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 big focus for us and it's it's uh good to help people there's all that's there's always the benefit of doing a good thing um but i think it's also going to end up being a smart business move we sent out an email like we always do once in a while about here's a 25 dollars gift certificate and i sent out a personal email to everyone saying you know pandemic hasn't been easy thank you for supporting us and it was a really heartfelt nice message I got back literally like a hundred emails, love letters about how much they appreciated the email. Did that prompt you to build on that? I mean, are you sending an email newsletter out? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I, I got back like two paragraphs of, you know, from some people about they love the store and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, wow, I, I don't think that would have happened if I just sent out an email uh, three years ago and just said, hey, here's a $25 gift certificate. Thanks for your business. I don't think I would have gotten that response. And I'm not smart enough to have predicted that. It was kind of a weird accident. I've got good and bad in me. The good in me is like, look, if, we, if our business goes down during this, I want to go down doing something good. Uh, the more Machiavellian part of me is like, we come out on the other side, we're going to have a lot more friends. We're going to have a very top of the funnel that's, uh, that's going to be profitable. And uh, hopefully those two things can coexist. Uh, I will say we did not bank on uh, this lasting longer than a year and a half. I, I'd said 18 months and I was wrong. Uh, and maybe we're almost done with it. Maybe we're not. I mean, China just locked everything down and Britain just said we're not doing anything anymore. So who knows? You know, if I saw the other day a friend of, me, a friend of mine sent me a text saying, you know, back in 2020, when we were in episode one of the pandemic, we all thought this was an eight episode documentary. Now we're realizing it's more like Grey's Anatomy and they're just endless seasons of upon seasons. So uh, who, who knows whether our strategy will pay long term, but for now it feels right. I was going to ask you about that. We're just about out of time, but I'm curious. This has gone on longer than I think anyone expected. Um, how, are you, how are each of you coping with the current situation? Every two days I get another email. Someone's got it, but no one's gotten really sick and we're wearing masks and doing what we can, but everybody's pretty much numb to it. and. Uh, Business is okay. I got nothing to complain about. I have to remind people once in a while that, you know, my parents' generation lived through World War II of four years of wondering whether my father was going to come back alive. So I'm sorry if you're upset you can't go to brunch. I remind myself of that because it's bad, but it ain't that bad. Am I wrong? Hello? Am I wrong? <laughs> you tell me, we're living through World War II, was that worse than this? Definitely. <laughs> William, I didn't have heard from you. Am I wrong? I didn't live during World War II. I, I am not very popular on this, Jay. I actually am dead aligned with you. I, I, I'm endlessly optimistic. I feel like we live in, I mean, what if this had happened 10 years earlier when there was not nearly the internet connectivity that we had? What if it had happened, you know, fill in the blank with, when we weren't able to communicate as the immunologists have to come up with vaccines? I just... What if we didn't get PPP money? I completely agree with you, Jay. I, you know, we're going down a road of a podcast where I'm going to end up losing followers, but I just think there is a culture of vic victimhood out there that is really, really not helpful to the situation. Why? Why would that cost you followers? Um, because there's a culture of victimhood and I just minimized everybody's suffering and pain by saying, suck it up and deal with it. So let's just keep track. You lost some people because of Anthony Robbins, perhaps, and now you lost it. Boy, <laughs> I, I hope you're holding okay. All right. Well, my thanks to Jay Goltz, Liz Picarazzi, and William Vanderblumen. Thanks for sharing, guys. Wait, wait. Don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. 
Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.